am Sarthak Bakchi. I, I teach here at the School of Arts and Sciences and I'm also the convener of the seminar and lecture series. And it gives me great pleasure today to uh, invite all of you and to welcome all of you actually uh, to this very interesting uh, seminar uh, webinar that we will be having. Uh, and, uh, and this actually, uh, the School of Arts and Sciences as part of the Ahmedabad University uh, is a young and dynamic uh, place uh, for doing excellent academic work and uh, engagement and uh, the biology and life sciences division is one of the uh, older institutions uh, in this new and uh, buzzing place uh, and today we are delighted to have uh, uh, my colleagues uh, Professor Subhash Rajpurohit and Professor Krishna Swami uh, who will be moderating and who will be con uh, convening this discussion with two very eminent scientists uh, uh, and we will be talking about a very interesting aspect of uh, doing good science with uh, small money. And this is something which perhaps uh, uh, will be useful and interesting to uh, a lot of young scientists, curious uh, young PhD students and uh, young research scholars uh, all across. Uh, and uh, just a little bit about the seminar and lecture series uh, before we begin formally with, the, with today's session, I would just like to tell a little bit about the seminar and lecture series uh, and also about the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, that uh, in the School of Arts and Sciences, we have, uh, I mean, our primary aim has been to uh, develop uh, a kind of interdisciplinary research and interdisciplinary approach to studying uh, some of the questions which are critical to understanding uh, today's society, to, uh, to understanding the modern society. Uh, and that in includes looking at uh, problems uh, of science, problems of social sciences, uh, of the society, uh, humanities, right? And even uh, uh, performing arts. Uh, so uh, the divisions are, uh, of the school are uh, made in such a way that it en encompasses all these different uh, fields and disciplines of study and tries to uh, assimilate uh, these different approaches and tries to uh, uh, encourage students uh, into uh, taking these, you know, divergent ways of understanding uh, and even solving uh, problems which are critical to today's uh, society. Uh, and uh, the seminar and lecture series in, in that vein uh, is a kind of a platform uh, which has been uh, put up uh, or which has been established uh, with the purpose of uh, enabling a meaningful discussion between uh, professors, faculty members, or even researchers uh, who are who have done very distinguished research and who have excelled in their respective fields of study, and to try to bring them into conversation uh, with the faculty members and students uh, here at Ahmedabad University. And uh, this uh, seminar and lecture series is also our way uh, of contributing to the uh, larger academic discourse. Uh, in Ahmedabad, which is why we also have students uh, and people uh, joining from other academic institutes uh, uh, in the city of Ahmedabad. Uh, of course, the pandemic has given us the opportunity to go on to the uh, webinar form or the online platform, uh, which enables us to open our gates uh, and open our platforms uh, to even a wider audience in a global context. Uh, and that is what we have been actually uh, also encouraged by seeing uh, so many people coming and joining our seminars and lectures uh, from different places, from different geographic uh, boundaries. So we are not only now, uh, uh, press, uh, you know, not only crossing the disciplinary boundaries, but we are also crossing ge geographic boundaries, uh, which is always you know, a, a kind of a motivation and a kind of an encouragement uh, or, or sort of, uh, you know, shot in the arm uh, for, for us as organizers. And again, with that, uh, uh, I'm extremely happy and delighted uh, to have two uh, such eminent scientists today. Uh, and I would like, my, uh, like to invite my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh Patkar, to please do the introductions uh, for today's speakers. Uh, Rajesh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarthak. Uh, okay, so I would like to welcome our both the guests today. So I, I would start with uh, Professor Rag Raghavendra Gadakar. Uh, so Professor Raghavendra Gadakar is the Year of Science Chair Professor at the Center for Ecological Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, and Honorary Professor at Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, 
and non resident permanent fellow of the Weizenshaft Kalig Institute of Advanced Study in Berlin. He obtained BSc and MSc in Zoology from Bangalore University, India, and PhD in Molecular Biology from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India. He has published over 300 research papers and articles and two books. His research work has been recognized by a number of awards, including Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award. B.M. Birla Science Prize, Homi Baba Fellowship, D.P. Pal National Environment Fellowship on Biodiversity, the World Academy of Sciences Award in Biology, and Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany. He is an elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Science Academy, the National Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World, Foreign Associate of the National Academy of Sciences, U.S., the German National Science Academy, Leopoldina, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and founder president, Indian Society of Evolutionary Biologists. Currently, he is working on a book, How to Design Experiments in Animal Behavior and Do Cutting Edge Research at Trifling Cost. He writes a fortnightly column in The Wire Science entitled More Fun Than Fun sharing the spirit and joy of science with a wide audience. Uh, here I would like to welcome Professor Amitabh Joshi. Uh, professor Amitabh Joshi is a professor at Evolutionary and Organismal Biology Unit, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research and adjunct professor at Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Mohali, India, and editor of publications, Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore. He obtained bachelor's and master's degree from University of Delhi and PhD in evolutionary genetics from Washington, Washington State University, Pullman, USA. He has published over 100 research papers and articles and one book with L.D. Mueller. His research work has been recognized by a number of awards, including Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award for Biological Sciences, Young Leader in Science and Technology Award, and J.C. Bose National Fellowship. He is an elected fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, the Indian National Science Academy, and fellow and founding member of Indian Society of Evolutionary Biologists. During the past 25 years, he has published an active school of, uh, he, sorry, he has established an active school of research in the area of exp experimental ecology and evolutionary biology. And interestingly, he is also a poet. So with that, I would like to, uh, request Krishna to uh, take it further. Uh, uh, I, would I would request all the participants to post their questions in the chat box so that we can have an un 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 uninterrupted uh, stream of uh, the lecture. And I would also like to uh, uh, request Professor Joshi to start uh, the webinar. Thank you very much. OK, uh, good afternoon. And uh, it's a great pleasure to to be here and I particularly congratulate the organizers for organizing a webinar on such an interesting theme, which often doesn't get too much attention, which is good science with small money. Uh, so to begin with, uh, I think I'll just uh, very briefly introduce you to a small experiment that we did in our lab here in Bangalore quite a few years ago. And uh, I'm not going to show any slides. I'll just talk about it. Uh, the, the experiment will be fairly easy to understand. But uh, uh, before I get into that, I'd just like to take uh, two minutes to say that this idea of doing good science with small money is actually something that I faced uh, when I was a PhD student in the US. Uh, I was doing my PhD, and I wanted to do some work with uh, experimental evolution with fruit flies. But my PhD supervisors, one of them was a field ecologist and the other was a mathematician. So there was no fruit fly lab that belonged to my advisor that I could work in. So my advisor gave me a small controlled environment growth chamber and I sort of begged, borrowed and scrounged for basic fruit fly culturing materials like bottles and so on and I applied for a small grant from Sigma Xi for $900, which I got. And I eventually spent about two to $300 from my pocket. And, and that was the entire cost of my PhD. And this involved also 
fabricating quite a few of the, the required equipments uh, myself and it was a very interesting and enjoyable experience. So to, let me now come to this one short experiment I would like to, to share as an example of good science with small money. And I'll also tell you a little bit of the backdrop against which this experiment came about. So around the year 2002, I was teaching population dynamics at JNC. And uh, we were discussing this issue in class about the possible evolution of population stability. And this was a very interesting issue that had become prominent after Robert May's work in the 1970s where Robert May basically pointed out that if you look at very simple population growth models like the logistic model in discrete time or the uh, so-called exponential logistic or recur model in discrete time, uh, as the per capita population growth rate of the population increases, these models increasingly show unstable behavior. And the conundrum that this raised was that uh, the, the two traits that feed into having a high populational growth rate are basically fecundity, how many offspring you have in a unit time, and survivorship. And all else being equal, natural selection could be expected to favor the evolution of better survival and greater fecundity, in which case natural selection should automatically favor the evolution of populations becoming more and more unstable in how their numbers fluctuate over time. Yet, if one examines most laboratory and many natural populations, they actually, many of them show fairly stable dynamics. And so trying to uh, find both proximal or ecological reasons as well as ultimate or evolutionary explanations for why so many populations or so many species are actually relatively stable was an interesting issue in ecology at the time. And and I was teaching this in the classroom and we were talking about some previous studies which I had been involved in as a postdoc, which had failed to find empirical support for some of the theoretical uh, hypotheses about how population stability might evolve. And then I was talking about this uh, bunch of mathematical models that suggested that perhaps stability might evolve not as a trait that is under selection in itself, but as a byproduct of evolution of some other traits. And so I was at the blackboard and I was saying, uh, so for example, you know, there might be some selection pressure in nature that is causing the population to evolve a certain set of traits. And as a correlated response to that, perhaps they are evolving maybe reduced fecundity. And then my then student Prasad, who is now professor at Isaac Mohali, looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and said, uh, do you realize that this implies, and then looked at me, and I immediately realized what he was saying, and I didn't even have to reply. I smiled back at him. And then after the class, we started planning this experiment. And the idea that struck us during that lecture was we had populations of fruit flies in our lab that had been subjected to selection for rapid development from egg to adulthood for couple of hundred generations and they had become very faster developing and also as a result because their larval duration was quite short they were also quite small when they became adults and we know that all else being equal in a lot of insects adult size in females is correlated with greater fecundity and these selected populations had actually become less fecund than their ancestors as a result of adapting to a situation where they had to develop really fast. That was the most important thing they had to do in our experimental routine. So we then set up a little uh, population dynamics experiment where we created multiple small populations from these selected uh, faster developing lines as well as their ancestral controls. And we looked at their population dynamics by censusing the number of flies in each population every generation for a number of generations. So the primary data we collect is simply counting the number of flies in each population every generation. And at the end of it, we checked and found that indeed the faster developing populations had also evolved greater population stability 
compared to their ancestors and that this was a byproduct of the fact that they had been selected for master development and therefore they had evolved a reduced fecundity and also a slightly reduced survivorship, both of which ended up lowering their per capita population growth rate. And so this, uh, this entire experiment basically consisted of a large number of single glass vial populations of fruit flies. It involved counting the fruit flies every generation, which you do with the naked eye. Uh, it involved a small setup for anesthetizing fruit flies using carbon dioxide. Now you can buy fancy setups of that kind for about a couple of black rupees nowadays with CO2 guns and everything. Uh, we actually manufactured our own setup uh, using a large petri dish and some filter paper. So it cost about uh, 20 rupees to make the CO2 distribution system uh, as opposed to about 2 lakh rupees and it works just fine. And uh, this particular experiment, uh, I'll just show you uh, something up on the screen right now. Uh, this is a recent book published called Conceptual Breakthroughs in Evolutionary Ecology. So this book outlines 65 major breakthroughs on the borderline of ecology and evolution starting from Darwin's theory of natural selection and continuing on to the present day. And this little study that we did in Bangalore, which cost maybe less than 10,000 rupees to, to carry out, is the only non-Western piece of research that finds a place in this book. And so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here and just say that, uh, you know, uh, one can do very interesting and consequential experiments uh, for, for fairly moderate amounts of money if one focuses on addressing interesting questions rather than being focused on why oh, should use some fancy technique or my, my technology should be cutting edge. I think the question is what one should focus on. And if you work on interesting questions, you can often do great work without necessarily requiring very fancy technology. To do it. Thank you very much, Professor Joshi, to uh, start this uh, session with such an interesting experiment. And this really tells us that it's not always necessary that you should have a very big sophisticated lab to start off uh, with a very interesting project. I would like to request uh, Professor Garakkar to uh, tell a few words and also to share his slides so that uh, we can go ahead. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and to participate in what is really a topic that is very close to my heart. I have been talking about this for a long time. I've been practicing this and now I'm writing a book on this subject. So I'm delighted that there are other people who also think <laughs> along these lines. It's really wonderful to be here. Uh, in the Q&A, we will go to the greater details, but Subhash suggested that we should each present one of our favorite experiments. This is a tough job because there are so many favorite experiments of mine which can all be done by anybody, anywhere, almost no money. Uh, but today I have chosen to talk about one experiment, not done by me, but one of my all time uh, favorite experiments. So let me see if I can successfully share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen with the, with the poster here? Yeah. yeah. Very good. Okay. So this is just a starting point. So this experiment concerns honeybees. It concerns how honeybees know how far they have flown. What is the distance they have flown? And this information is important for honeybees because uh, the Nobel laureate Carl von Frisch showed uh, in the very early part of 20th century that honeybees return home and perform a dance. And through this dance language, they convey information to the bees at home, both about the distance and the direction to the food sources they have found. And once the bees at home watch this dance, they can on their own go and find that food. They don't need this particular bee anymore. Uh, question that remained unanswered for a long time is how do the bees know how far the food is, how far they have flown? In fact, it turns out that Carl von Frisch himself had some theories which turned out actually not to be supported. So for a long time, it was not known 
how the bees know how far they have flown. In 19, uh, let's see, let me go to the next slide. Okay, so in 1996, two people published a paper in the Journal of Experimental Biology in which they proposed a hypothesis which seemed very unreasonable. They said, we think this is how honeybees estimate the distance they have flown. We propose, they said, an optical flow hypothesis. That is, bees use the speed of retinal image motion perceived from the ground to estimate distance. That is, how much image has gone by. This seemed too sophisticated and too complicated for the bees to do it. So the question was, how do we test this? Now, the idea itself looks so complicated that the first impression would be that we need some very complex technology to estimate how much image is actually, you know, you need some high speed cameras, etc. But uh, my friend Mandiam Srinivasan from the National University of uh, Australia in Canberra did a brilliant experiment, extremely simple experiment, which anybody could have done. What he did was he said if we want to test whether this hypothesis is correct, then we must alter, rather than try to measure the uh, image motion on the bees, let us alter the image motion and see whether the bees will be fooled. In fact, it turns out that in the field of animal behavior, fooling animals has been a very powerful technique to understand what animals do. Because if you can fool them in this way, then you know that that is what they do. So he decided to fool the animals by making them misunderstand whether how much distance they are flown. And he used a very simple technique. He constructed using just plywood, a little tunnel. Okay, so I just want to explain what this optical flow hypothesis is in a very simple way. We also use this optical flow. So I have a quotation here from my favorite Sherlock Holmes story, Silver Blaze. And in this story, there is a passage. We are going well, said Holmes, looking out of the window and glancing at his watch. Our rate at present is 53 and a half miles an hour. I have not observed the quarter mile posts, replied James Watson. And to this Sherlock Holmes said, nor have I, but the telegraph posts upon this line are 60 yards apart and the calculation is a simple one. And this is the calculation that bees might be making. So Srinivasan and his colleagues constructed a simple plywood tunnel and they generated on their computer some right, random patterns and pasted it inside the walls of this tunnel and trained the bees to fly through this tunnel. Now, because the walls of the tunnel are so close to the bees, there's a lot of image motion happening, much more than that would happen in nature. So the bees should overestimate the distance. They should think they have flown a great deal, even though they have flown very little. And we can ask the bees, how far do you think you have flown? And this fortunately is very easy. You can actually ask the bees because the bees come home, perform a dance and tell you how far the food is. So by looking at their dance, you know what they know and you can measure the, their dance. Now, the way Srinivasan actually did very simple experiment. The experiment simply consisted of a beehive here and he constructed four of these plywood tunnels with patterns inside. Three he kept at 35 meters, one he kept very close. And in the first experiment, which is this tunnel, what he did was he kept the food at the beginning of the tunnel, which means the bees actually didn't go, have to go into the tunnel. So this is a kind of control experiment. So the tunnel should have no influence on their behavior. In the second experiment, he kept the food at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel was six meters long. So the bees have, not, have now had to fly 35 meters outside the tunnel and six meters inside the tunnel. Inside the tunnel, they experience a great deal of optic flow, much more than what they would experience outside in 35 meters. And this is second experiment. In the third experiment, he did something very clever. In the same tunnel, instead of putting this random pattern, he put parallel lines. Now, parallel lines will give you no optic flow because you don't see anything. And even though it's the same tunnel, even though it is six meters long, even though it's at 35, meters, even though at the food is the end of the tunnel, it has no pattern generating ability. Finally, he kept one tunnel very close to the hive and where the bees only flew six meters outside, six meters inside. And he said, even now they must 
overestimate. Now, there are, the simplest way to find out whether the bees got fooled is to look at the kinds of dances. Honey bees perform two kinds of dances. They perform round dances when the food is very nearby. And nearby is approximately 50 meters away. If it is far away, they perform the so-called waggle dance. So you can count how many bees are performing say, round dance, thinking that the food is close by, and how many are performing waggle dance, thinking that the food is far away. Now in experiment one, where the food was at the beginning of the tunnel, most of the bees performed round dance, because the food they thought is just 35 meters. But in experiment two, where they just had to go one, five, six meters more, 41 meters, most of them performed the waggle dance. They thought the food was very far. In experiment three, where they had parallel lines, where they should not have overestimated, most of the bees performed the round dance, as expected. And in experiment four, even though it was so close to the height, most of the bees performed the waggle dance. Clearly, the bees were getting fooled exactly as predicted. Now, this is just step one. Then he realized that by simply doing some high school mathematics, or middle school mathematics, he can take this much further and he can actually calibrate the so-called odometer of the bees. The odometer is the instrument which you actually measure the amount that you So he said he could calibrate. So let me show you uh, some argument. So in this, what he did was he actually not only saw how many were performing the bagel dance, but he looked at the speed of the bagel dance because the speed is what is correlated with distance. So you will see on the next slide that then he did one experiment where he made the bees fly outdoors and he got a calibration curve. That means for how much distance, what kind of waggle dance do they perform? So you find out that as a control experiment in an outdoor experiment, you have this information with you. Now he found that in the first tunnel, 35 meters outside, six meters outside is 41 meters long. The dance waggle duration happened to be 529 milliseconds, which corresponds in the outdoor situation to 230 meters, which means that a flight of six meters was interpreted by the bees as 195 meters of flight because of the optic flow. Similarly, in another experiment, in the one where it kept close by, the six meters was interpreted as 178 meters. Taking the average of these two, six meters was in, inside the tunnel was interpreted by the bees as 186 meters. Now, the calculation is a simple one, as Sherlock Holmes said. The distance to each wall in the tunnel, the tunnel was 11 centimeters in diameter, so 5.5 centimeters to each wall, and one centimeter forward motion of the bee in the tunnel will result in a backward motion of the image on their eyes by an angle of 10.3 degrees in their lateral visual field. Therefore, six meters of forward motion should cause 6,180 degrees of image motion in the backward side. A six meter tunnel is equal to, we have seen, the bees think is 186 meters. So for 186 meters of flight, they have a 447 millisecond duration of the waggle, which means for one millisecond of duration, there is 13.9 degrees of motion. So this is the calibration and that's all that is needed. And since I started with, began, began, started with Sherlock Holmes, I will end by simply saying, elementary, my dear Watson, that's all that has to be done. Now the take home message from this is simply that science is often wrongly portrayed as an elitist activity accessible only to those endowed with large grants and sophisticated laboratories, not to mention white coats. Good science can be practiced by anyone with a sharp mind, even without any grants and laboratories. Science, as Amitabh Joshi said, if you focus on the question, science should become a democratic grassroots activity accessible to all, young and old, rich and poor. How can we do this? This is what we will talk about, but I just want to show you one more slide. Many years ago, I came across an interesting book. It was called, it said, warning, don't try this at home. 50 dangerous stunts and schemes to avoid. I want to paraphrase this, and I think we should write a book which says, do try this at home. 50 experiments in animal behavior, because they're not at all dangerous, and they may make you 
create really new knowledge. I'll stop here with the example, and in the Q and A, we can talk about a little bit more. Thank you, Professor Gadakar. This reminds me also of the Empire of the Ants by Bernard Werber, mm -hmm. book, which was like this is a very exciting book in which they actually take you to a world of ants, the social behavior of ants, honeybees being also social uh, uh, organisms. You can actually see that there's so much left to understand. Uh, in this, uh, in their society, the way they actually perform, and some of them have been fictionalized, like the Empire of the Ants. But this, you can still see the wonder, wonderful world out there. And thanks for sharing this. If I can stick out my neck and say one thing. Huh. My personal opinion huh. is that many of these things are not understood, have remained ununderstood, and will remain understood because most people are doing sophisticated science with big money, answering different questions. The interesting questions need no money, and that is not a fashionable thing to do. This is the problem. This is what we have to address. I, I completely agree with you. Completely agree with you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kadakar. Yeah, it was it was great. Yeah, very, very inspiring. And you know, with those basic, you know, tools and things, you know, one can really address serious scientific questions. And this tunnel example is, you know, wonderful. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, after, you know, you both have shared, you know, a few like very interesting experiments. And by now, I think our audience might have picked the idea or like what we are actually trying to address here. I hope they would have picked the central idea. And uh, now, so in the next, you know, this uh, continuing, you know, part of this, this session, we will try to touch base like three, four basic questions. And uh, I hope that uh, that will help all those, you know, young students and, you know, young faculty members, you know, how to design the research programs and how to deal with those day-to-day uh, -day problems in, you know, academia. So, um, so these three, four questions is um, um, for both of you. And we would like to hear from both of you. Uh, wh what are your responses to these, you know, uh, some fundamental questions, you know, around these lines. So, um, I would like to start with that first, uh, first question, and that's like, uh, like in your views, you know, what do you think is good science? Just we simply, if we start with this. Amitabh? Ah, okay, okay, uh, I, I, can, I can start. So I, I would uh, like to first put one disclaimer that what constitutes good science is a very, very subjective issue. And we are all sort of prisoners or victims, if you like, of our backgrounds, our experiences, and our personalities. So with that, I would just say that this is, I, I'm going to share with you what I think of when I hear the phrase good science, which may be very different from what many other people think of when they hear that phrase. So to me, first of all, See, there is one obvious dichotomy of good versus bad science, which is science which makes sense and science which is flawed. And that is not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about all the science that is good in the sense of not being flawed or not uh, being based on some error or mistake. But then to paraphrase George Orwell, all science is good, but some science is better. And here, in some sense, the way I look at science is to me, the way I decide that this is a piece of good science is the same way I decide that this is a good poem as opposed to merely being a, a reasonably nice poem. Uh, a good piece of science, ideally, to me, uh, should have an element of creativity. There should be some sort of lateral thinking involved. It should be beautiful in terms of the experimental design or the conceptual design if it's a theoretical piece of work. Uh, to me, ideally, good science addresses some conceptual issue rather than simply adding confirmatory facts to our, our compendium of facts. Uh, very often, good science will end up connecting things or concepts that earlier were believed to be unconnected to each other. So, you, you create new connections that people had not thought about. And in all these senses, a good experiment or even a good mathematical model or a good verbal model 
is like good poetry it's a metaphorical and succinct representation of some aspect of reality and uh, whatever makes a, a, a great poem great is what makes great size great it's that it's that creativity that unexpectedness some little twist that you didn't quite expect initially these are all the things that to me make up uh, make up good science yeah that's that's all that is Yeah, Professor Gadak, we would like to hear from you as well. Yeah, I completely agree with uh, Amitabh. Uh, it is true that uh, depends on whom you ask, because I recognize that there are different kinds of people who need to ask this question. For example, funders need to ask this question. If I am a head of a funding agency. Uh, either of the government or if i am a philanthropist i want to fund science then you might want to ask this question what is good science or if you are a politician and you want to convince people that you always have the poor man uh, uh, welfare at your heart then you may have a different way of uh, uh, saying what you think is good science but uh, as amitabh just says most of the people who should ask this question are scientists the number of people who fund science or who manage science or who evaluate science is a small number or at least should be a small number the vast majority of people should be scientists who do science and therefore we should be asking this question and therefore it is perfectly reasonable to focus on what a scientist should uh, uh, try to understand by what is good science uh, only thing i want to add to what amita said is the way i decide is the following for me the ultimate proof of good science is reading that science or knowing about it should create in me a sense of jealousy admiration is not enough i must feel jealous why didn't i do this why didn't i think of this and this jealousy introduces a very interesting dichotomy between less money and more money for example i was delighted to read that they have discovered the higgs boson but i didn't feel jealous there was no question of my discovering the x box but if somebody discovers something or does something which i could have done myself then i really feel jealous i cannot sleep that night that is good science that's how i recognize good science this automatically incorporates all the features that amita have said but also then distinguishes between less money and huge amount of money which i may not have as an undergraduate i was fascinated by two subjects my two most favorite subjects were molecular biology and animal behavior i used to read both of these every time i read molecular biology i was fascinated but never jealous it was for me molecular biology was like a drama like a play that is being played in the stage in heaven by god and i am here enjoying it but if somebody did an experiment on animal behavior which i could have done then i felt extremely jealous and that is why i finally chose animal behavior or animal i love both these subjects but there is a sense of jealousy in this and i think that sense of jealousy is extremely important students everybody should feel my god i could have done this why why not me and that will then add to all that amit of joshi says and bring in this future further element of doing good science with less money could i just add one sentence to what professor gadakkar said which which really tickled me a great deal uh in the in the world of uh, urdu and persian poetry uh, there is this concept of daad you know you appreciate somebody recites a good couplet and you give daad or you give appreciation but a much higher level of appreciation is you say ye sher kabil e rashk hai i became jealous by hearing this couplet and that is the highest form of appreciation that you get <laughs> that that's really really true in the sense that unless we can unless we connect to the problem this problem is probably we haven't understood the problem in the first place the question which has been asked one of the things which jealousy brings in i mean the, the concept idea of jealousy is that you are connecting to the problem in the sense that you know that you could have done this problem in probably the same way or a different way it's just that you just missed it out and that's something which makes you feel that uh, get that feeling of yes i just missed it that's something which uh, which brings it up but then 
if you look at the uh, since both of you bought the idea of uh, the concept of the the uh, you use the word funding agency the funding agency is sometimes the way at least when as young scientists when we apply for our grants we do see that they want an application how are you going to apply that but many of our problems are curious driven that they are fundamental problems which at this point of time i will not be able to vouch and say that this is going to be the application for it they are open ended problems they are problems which are the core which should we follow in the sense that should we strike a balance between the two should we go for uh, a fundamental problem dig deep, deep but then i will not be able to directly connect it to a disease i will not be able to directly connect it to uh, 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 an application of sorts but it actually unravels several of those things which are really important for the future applications that are that can be built on them so how do you think uh, we should look at it as fundamental problem scientists or a scientist who can strike a balance between the between the two i i can i can give two kinds of solutions to this problem hmm. this is a problem this is a real problem you can we cannot wish it away but we have to deal with it and i think there are two ways of dealing with it the first is that if i tell a funding agency say 10 years back if i told a funding agency that i'm going to discover the higgs boson they are not going to ask me what is the application so if your question is so profound so interesting so important conceptually nobody is going to ask you how you going to apply it. so you are the bar is that you have to set yourself your question has to be much higher if you say i'm going to find a way of filling the potholes in the roads of ahmedabad then people will make sure that can you really do this how many how many kilometers will you do they'll ask you 1000 questions so you are has to set very high if you want to do curiosity based fundamental research blue sky research then you must set your bar very high which is wonderful thing to do we must set our bar secondly that is one thing you should the second thing is you must set your bar low the less money you want the less question they will ask you you say i want a million dollars of course they will ask you what are you going to do you say i want 10000 rupees i want 1 lakh rupees i want 10 lakh rupees they will ask you much fewer question so you must set the bar of the profundity of your question much higher and the money much lower with these two i think we can try to navigate this evil of uh, uh where the quest even question that fund funding agencies ask because they will ask but these are the two simultaneously if you do these two i think there is a lot you can do with the present really lousy system of funding professor do you want to add a little on this uh, no i i i am not going to say anything specifically about funding agencies uh <clears throat> I, I think that has been admirably covered by the what Professor Gadakar said. I just uh, want to add add a little thing, especially since there are students in the audience. You see, we are we are conducting this online webinar, and videos are being transmitted back and forth. And uh, I hope that many of the students might have heard of a character in ancient Greece called Zeno. And Zeno came up with these peculiar paradoxes. for example he claimed that if you give the tortoise a head start over achilles the hero then achilles will never be able to overtake the tortoise because when the achilles moves 1 meter the tortoise would have moved 0.1 meter when achilles moves that 0.1 meter tortoise would have moved 0.01 meter etc etc so actually achilles will never overtake the tortoise if the tortoise is given a head start even though he runs fast now it Zeno's paradoxes bothered a lot of people in his time, 2,400 years ago or so, in in Greece, and continued to bother uh, people all along. And so, what is the connection between Zeno's paradox, which had no application whatsoever in mind? It was a curiosity-driven observation that logic suggests that the faster runner will not overtake the slower runner if the slower runner has a head start. But the the connection of that curiosity to today's video transmission and many other things not just video transmissions uh, is a long journey that begins with the notion that you can take a span of time or a span of space chop it into infinitesimal small bits 
and then analyze each one of those bits separately and then reassemble everything together i mean this is what eventually becomes the calculus uh, after passing through the development of algebra and then rene descartes and pierre fermat and everybody and then newton and leibniz and it becomes the calculus and it is required for you to be able to see me talking in real time in an online webinar but certainly you know had no application in mind he was just curious about where his logic took him and he was probably a mystery and a lot of great applications of science come about often much later and the original science was done out of curiosity and then eventually turns out to have some profound application so i think it's important to also keep that in mind that, that's perfectly right because i agree with both of you in the sense that if you look at uh, if einstein had not discovered the photoelectric effect you would probably not have uh, this conversation too in the sense that when he came up with the photoelectric effect nobody knew what 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 was its application so that's something which we all absolutely understand about this but then certain areas of science uh, tend to, i work on uh, molecular mechanisms of evolution too in the sense that in sense that a small a large part of my work involves molecular biology which is slightly towards the more expensive side than my other part of work which is first principle prediction of evolution which i can do with mathematical models and evolution experiments now i have this too but if i want to uh, if there are other areas which require some amount of expense in the sense that you do have uh, chemicals and consumables which turn out to be little more expensive so is there uh, a way can you give us some pointers as to like you know how to uh, take you already started off with this one two wonderful examples in in the sense that one with the honey bee example the other with the population dynamics example can you please expand a little in which we can solve an expensive problem and uh, or can you give us some pointers how we can bring it down and manage it in a way uh, that we can handle with less money nobody can claim that you can conduct a research problem project which requires you know one crore with one lakh of rupees this is not what is being claimed what is being claimed is that let us divide uh, this funding from one lakh rupees to one crore rupees into a few blocks so your project may require from 1 to 50 lakhs or 1 to 10 lakhs and your project will require from 20 to 50 lakhs or it may require a crop at each level we can think of how we can try and get more for a rupee you can't take 1 crore and make it 1 lakh but at each level we can try and this is this sounds trivial but it is not trivial because i can give you empirical evidence that scientists exaggerate the money they need they spend more money than it in fact i'll tell you what the great thing about scientists is you if I, you i'll give you, you give me a certain amount of money and i'll give you a problem for which that money is not adequate <laughs> this is what we are good at so whatever money you give me i will give you a scientific problem for which that money is not adequate this is what we specialize in and we need a little bit of money. nobody is saying that you know if you have a research you can one crore you can do it in one lakh but we have to apply our mind to see how we can use less money and get more out of it by thinking by doing very by it don't depends on in the details of the problem how you are going to do this depends on exactly the problem but i don't think we are applying our mind why because there is prestige in doing expensive science that is the <laughs> the problem is there is prestige at all levels at the level of scientists at the level of journals at the level of funding agencies everybody thinks you know if you submit a proposal which requires 10 crores probably the funding agency will send a team to your university to find out exactly what you are doing you ask them for 10 lakh they'll reject your proposal so that's where we have to change that social perception we have to delink prestige from money i would go to the extent of saying it should be the other way around i would go to the extent of saying that you should put the money spent in the denominator of your performance index how much did you do per rupee but even if you don't want to go that far keep it outside don't put it in the numerator of your performance index don't say i published 20 papers and i spent 20 crores multiply the two don't do that 
So that social prestige for expensive research has to go. And if that goes, then I think we can manage to the extent that possible to try and get, basically get more for the amount of money that you have. Agreed. Yeah, so, you know, I just wanted to add here, like we, uh, we are in a country where, you know, like uh, almost 60% population doesn't have even basic requirements. You know? And uh, funding agencies has limited funds, you know, and then this money goes and then this entire story comes, you know, around that chasing your loud ideas versus, you know, like uh, these uh, sporadic funding calls, you know, where sometimes you don't fit, you know, anywhere. And then, you know, keeping your that spirit alive, you know, it's, it's really frustrating sometimes. You know, then, you know, even like if you're asking for a small, small amount of money, it's sometimes, you know, like uh, people even don't look those projects. We have seen in this pandemic, you know, like uh, uh, everything has been channelized for the reasons where we really not capable. Even like well-established labs in the Europe and America, it's, a, it's they are you know facing problems even after passing nine ten months, you know, and then on a country like a developing country like us, you know, where that you know like as you said long back ten years ago that whatever we do in the molecular biology, those Westerners are at least hundred or plus years are already ahead to us, you know, so you know like this is uh, this is uh, some some basic you know like the problem lies here and uh, yeah i don't know how you know these uh, young investigators you know should take this and how to interpret this you know like in indian context uh, what do you say like could i take that no, please, please please yeah. so i think this is a very important point and there are a couple of observations i would like to sort of add to this and this, uh, I, I, I'm now speaking uh, just about biology, not, not about other disciplines of science. Anyway, I don't know too much about any other disciplines of science. But within biology, uh, uh, there is a certain lack of balance in how we understand and appreciate biology today. It's partly true of other countries in the world also, but it is particularly true of India, and that is what directly concerns us because we are scientists working in India. Uh, there is this perception that uh, the only worthwhile or real biology that can be done is at the molecular or cellular level. There is nothing to be done at the organismal or populational level, which is absolutely ridiculous, but this is deep suited, uh, deep uh, seated. You look at, uh, you know, notices advertising a seminar or a conference and they say, discussion meeting on modern biology and the modern biology is used as a synonym for molecular biology as though modern ecology, modern behavior and modern evolution are, uh, are not modern. Uh, but that's really not true. I mean, I see this in, in, in committees where people are evaluating the work. For example, there will be somebody who is a first rate taxonomy and systematics person. And they have done fantastic work in classical taxonomy. Another person who really is very superficial is not doing deep work in taxonomy, but happens to be using molecular phylogenetic methods. And half the committee, which are usually molecular biologists, will immediately say, oh, this guy is wonderful. He's using modern methods. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is standard. You see this again and again and again. But here, there is a bit of a double whammy. So I completely agree with what Subhash and Professor Gadakta said that, see, when it comes to certain areas of molecular biology, those are technology intensive and cost intensive. And therefore, if we think for a minute of science also as a little bit of a competitive game, uh, it is harder for us in India to compete with our counterparts in more advanced countries because they have better equipment, better funds, you know, they can get their fine chemicals faster than we can and so on and so forth. So there's always a, 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 a loss of competitive edge. Whereas, whereas if I'm doing research in the area of ecology, behavior, or evolution, uh, there is no technology gap that I have to compete against. It's just my ideas versus that person's ideas. It's a level playing. But now we come to the double value. 
So in some sense, in India, even somebody sitting in an undergraduate largely teaching college, in principle, could do fantastic research in ecology, evolution, and behavior very easily. But they would need to be able to understand the present state of understanding of those disciplines and what are the interesting questions. And here we get hit by the double whammy because we don't teach these subjects in our curricula. We only teach people about DNA and RNA and proteins and at best cells. And so the people in our universities and our students never get a real feel for what are the kinds of questions that are still open to be asked, fundamental questions that are still open to be asked in these fields of biology because they are never introduced to these fields of biology as research areas. I have actually had the experience of giving a talk many years ago in the zoology department in a very good university in India. And five minutes into my talk, the chairperson of the department stood up and said, Sir, anyway, Darwin told that survival of the fittest. So what is there to do research in evolution? Right. And, and this guy was the chair of the department. So you can imagine what this what impression the students had. So the problem is, in so many of our universities and institutes, we have all kinds of people trying to do essentially second rate or third rate molecular biology with their meager resources, because they feel that that is the only important thing to do. Whereas if they knew the subjects well, they could actually do first rate research in ecology, evolution of behavior without requiring great resources. But they are not aware of what the questions are. And, and this disconnect, you know, how do we bridge this disconnect, I think is a very important uh, uh, factor on this. And I would just like to add one more thing to what Professor Kadakar said, you know, in terms of putting the money into the denominator. Um, I keep hearing this here and there, you know, when you go to important places where important people gather in Delhi and other, other, other places, saying, where, where are the, the world leaders? in biology in India. And my answer has always been, you're looking in the wrong place. You're looking for the world leaders and among the molecular biologists, you're not finding them. You should look among the ecologists and evolutionary biologists and you will find them. I mean, one of us is talking to us right now, right? Uh, Professor Gadakkar is very much a world leader in his, in his area of social evolution. And I think if you look at the small community of ecology and evolutionary biologists in India, and the amount of money they spend, our contributions to the growth of knowledge in biology in our subdisciplines is far, 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 far greater than any other area in biology. And again, a reason why this is not appreciated is because most people, as they go through the education system, don't even get the feeling that ecology and evolution are active research areas. I mean, just one last example. Uh, if you look at the number of labs in the world doing long-term evolutionary experimental biology as a means of addressing fundamental questions in ecology and evolution, more than 50% of those labs are in India. Nobody knows this. Can you imagine the level of media attention that would happen if I could tell you that more than 50% of the labs doing cancer biology in the world are in India? Okay. I rest my case. Thank you. Uh, Professor Joshi, you are so right. In the sense that there's one thing which uh, I would like to add in terms of any, as, as, a, as a question. One probable reason is, as you said, is because of the training. In the sense that if you have to do, say, population dynamics or one of these fundamental, wonderful questions, the amount of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the background required, it builds very fast in the sense that the research is more... Uh, uh, heavy in terms of certain parts of science, which probably uh, the students or the faculty are not trained for in uh, as a pure biologist. That's probably one of the reasons why, uh, you know, they, they always look at the, the other side of the globe and not look at this side of the globe in terms of ecology and evolution, wherein there's so much advances which has happened in India and also in the world. So how do we bring about this awareness in the sense that if you have a rigid uh, curriculum, most of the uh, biology departments have a curriculum and the amount of math that is introduced anywhere, 
which is actually required for a very good understanding of evolutionary biology is considerable in the sense that it's not that we can ignore that and just look at it. How do we bring about this awareness? Is there a way we can actually uh, improve on this and uh, build this uh, infrastructure? They, yeah, I think uh, Professor Gadekar wanted to say something. No, if you're going on to education, maybe we should, because I want to say something to your original question about funding. But if we are running out of time, we can go on. No, 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 no. We have, we have a lot of time, Professor Gadekar, please. I just please. wanted to add to all the things that Amitabh Joshi said, which are, of course, very, very close to my heart, and I 100% agree with him. In fact, we talk about this all the time. But I wanted to add something else. When we talk about amount of money, we are a poor country, we don't have it, so on. We have to break up, break down this problem into different parts. For example, if this was a meeting where we were addressing politicians about how India, what kind of money you should spend on research, can it afford, uh, you know, poor people are there, there's no food, then you have one kind of discourse. Or if we are talking to, let's say, heads of funding agencies, they already have a limited budget, how should they distribute it, you know, for which so that's a different discourse. But there's a third discourse, and that is an individual research. What do I do? And that, again, I will come back to that. I think that is this forum. This, that is the thing we should discuss here. As an individual scientist, given the reality of the funding situation, of all of these realities, let's accept all of those realities. How can I swim in this polluted water? We should ask ourselves. So when I began my career, I really sat down very seriously and prepared three kinds of research questions which I am equally interested in. One set required a reasonable amount of funding, second required much less funding, and third required zero funding. I actually wrote down, these problems interest me, this is the kind of research I can do, this is what I would do if I had no grant, this is what if I do if I have small grants, this is what if I, I would do if I had a reasonably bigger grant. And I can fall back to each of these drawers in my table and depending on what money I have on that day. And all of those problems are important and interesting to me. I've already decided that before that. So given that this situation, we have to gear. You see, at the end of your career, you can't say, oh, I didn't do much because, you know, in India, you can't get much money. It is true that you can't get much money, but how do we deal with it? So given all the problems, take them for granted, take them as unable to change. And yet we must prepare ourselves to do the best we can under this situation. And it is possible. And we don't do it enough. Thank you. So we are reaching to that uh, very last question before we open it up. Uh, Professor Joshi wanted to probably add to the thing about how to frame, uh, frame a curriculum. How can we improve on this? Because evolution and ecology is such an important area. And they do that it does require some amount of mathematical foundation. I mean, I might be complete wrong. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Joshi, please. <laughs> no, no, you are absolutely right. And, and see, the problem is that curricular reform is a very, very vast thing because education is both a state subject and uh, probably now on the concurrent respect and other things. But uh, it's a very vast thing if you want to try to do curricular reform starting from school and college and so on. So that is very difficult. And again, as Professor Kadakar said, uh, you know, there are certain realities which perhaps in your lifetime and my lifetime are not going to go away. So then the question becomes, how do we deal with it? Uh, I can share with you my experience of how I dealt with it. I was among those people. See, today I do both theoretical and experimental work. I have done theoretical work of both kinds, analytic theory as well as simulations based theory, which is actually more like experiments. Uh, Simulation-based studies are not really theory in that sense. Uh, so I've done both kinds of theory as well as experiments. And uh, uh, I, I did not study mathematics after 10th standard. In those days, there was no option. You had to choose either biology or math. And I chose biology because I was a little bit more interested in biology than math at that point, although I really liked math as well. And uh, I made up for those gaps when I was a PhD student. I actually spent a lot of time taking basic first and second year undergrad courses in math. Uh, made up for it there and then learned many things on my own. Uh, Nonlinear dynamics is something that I do research on. I, I have uh, 
published a lot of research on it. I teach it. It's not something I've ever learned myself. I picked it up by talking to friends who are physicists and electrical engineers and reading things. And, and you can always do that. And in fact, I, I have said this in various places before also. See, today we hear a great deal about being interdisciplinary. And most of the times when you hear about interdisciplinary work, you hear about it in the context of collaborations. Hmm. I have this interesting experimental system, and now some modeling needs to be done. So let me catch hold of a physicist who will have the tools to do the modeling, and I'll supply the data. I, I keep getting approached by people from a background in applied math and physics saying, you know what, you have lots of data, so why don't we collaborate? And my reaction is, no, no, I can do the modeling myself. Uh, it's much more fun that way. I think it's also important to be interdisciplinary in your own head, not just via collaborations. We should uh, take the effort to, to learn whatever tools are required to address our question of interest. And this brings me back to the primacy of the question. I think when doing science, the primary thing one should think about is the question that you are interested in. Based on that, you might choose your experimental system, if it's an experimental study. Uh, a lot of people do it the other way. They're like, oh, I'm a Drosophila person. I will only work with Drosophila regardless of the question. Um, I work with Drosophila and I have much of my life, but that's because Drosophila has turned out to be a good system for the kinds of questions I was interested in. Tomorrow, if I'm interested in a different question for which Drosophila is not a good system, I will change systems and I will invest the amount of time and energy required to learn that new system. Same with tools and techniques. Um, we should not let our familiar toolkit dictate what kind of question we ask. We should decide on the question and then expand our toolkit, put in the effort, expand our toolkit and learn whatever tools and techniques are necessary to address that question. That's my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I completely agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I have one more, you know, like um, one question and you can definitely help us, you know, like, like young students and young investigators, you know, like uh, uh, as soon as PhD is done, you know, uh, many of us have gone for the postdoc and many, you know, like young PhD aspirants, you know, look for postdocs and as soon as postdoc is over, they're looking for faculty positions. And then when they join, you know, these new universities and like research centers and then this very fundamental question comes, you know, should I be beating that same line like my advisor used to you know, work on or should I entirely take on a different path? You know, this is like, uh, it's a two way, you know, like one is known and one is like the other direction is entirely unknown, you know, and uh, many do this experiment, but like most of the time people avoid doing that. So uh, uh, like, what are your views? I would like to know that, you know, like uh, how should, you know, I, because like internally, if you ask me, like as a researcher, I would avoid to do what my PhD advisor used to do or what my postdoc advisor used to do. I would find something a little bit more exciting for me where I can, you know, carve out something, you know, where I can contribute to the science. That's one way and the other way, you know, that. Uh, many people do that. So, like, what's your like take on on this? Yeah, please, Professor Gadekar, you raised your hand. Yeah. There is no one size fits all answer. I can give you examples of people who got the Nobel Prize after continuing to do what they did with their supervisor. I can give you examples of people who got the Nobel Prize by completely changing what they did with their supervisor. So it is not simply a dichotomy between continuing same or not. As young investigators, the one thing that young investigators don't do, we have to sit down and do what in other subjects is called a feasibility analysis. We don't do a feasibility analysis. We must ask, how interesting is this question? How important is this question? How novel is my approach? How much money do I need? Do I have, will I have the money to do it in this way? We must ask all of this and then choose whether it is uh, similar to what I was doing my PhD is actually a minor issue. There, of course, you can also ask, is my supervisor unhappy that I'm doing this? Is he going to try and uh, cut me off? And uh, 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 Or is my supervisor saying, very, I'm very glad you do this because I want to. So you take all. So it is not a dichotomy between continuing and changing. I know examples on both sides. The important thing is to consider all these factors and think very much about this. 
what we problem is we just automatically blindly mechanically start doing something either because we've done it before or because it's something is available here we don't spend enough time on planning and doing a feasibility analysis also you must ask will okay what is the result i might get will i be happy with that or will i consider that adequate so all of this we have to do internally this cannot be taught it has to be done internally by each person so joshi would you like to add well i i would first of all say i completely agree with professor dadakar just said uh, it, it's not a dichotomy at all uh, and i think again the most important thing i would say is uh, one should focus on the question and a question should not be terribly narrow uh, not a one experiment question i'm saying some intertwined set of questions uh, a, a little area and and then do the kind of feasibility study that was the director just mentioned and think about whether you can do it and and one should also bear in mind that very often interests in research will change often over a span of a few years often because of what came out of some experiment which suggests a new avenue that you had not thought of earlier i mean uh, one thing i keep telling my students for example is you know somebody will come to you one day and say said this experiment failed and i say what do you mean by the experiment failed and they say well you know i was thinking that this is what will happen but that didn't happen i said no that's not a failure that's actually a grand success because if the experiment gave you the results that you predicted that suggests that you already understand that little topic quite well because you were able to successfully predict so there's nothing new to learn if your experiment gave you a result that shocked you that means there is some stuff there which you are yet to understand and so now you have something to work on for the next 5 years to figure out why were you so surprised by the results of your experiment i mean to me an experiment is a failure if i realize at a later point that there's a flaw in the experiment and therefore it has to be thrown away all the results have to be thrown away that is a failure an experiment that gives you an unexpected result is a great thing that is what a lot of understanding finally comes out for so i think we also have to be a little conscious of the fact that uh, uh you know one can change our mind uh i remember when i joined jnc as an assistant professor i had written a few pages worth of a proposal of what i intend to do over the next 5 years and as it turns out i did a little bit of that and a little bit of something else the something else turned out to be far more interesting and finally i didn't do much of that at all i did all kinds of things that i had not written about and and luckily uh, nobody came back after 5 years and said by the way you were supposed to do research on that topic what happened because i was doing three other things which had nothing to do with that uh, but one one point i would like to to make is i think uh, see compared to when we were uh, when i was a young assistant professor that is already about 25 years ago uh, in professor kadakar's case a little bit longer uh the uh, the culture in which science is done has also changed so there are certain kinds of pressures relating to publication etc today that were perhaps not so severe 25 years ago and that was very nice uh, so so today in some sense a young pi has to balance between an interest in working on a fundamental problem and i think younger people should be the ones who work on fundamental questions because they are at the peak of their intellectual and creative abilities at that age compared to those of us who are much older all we have going for us is experience uh, our intellectual abilities are nowhere near as sharp as they were when we were 25 years old right? uh, but at the same time if you work on fundamental questions that is often not going to give rise to quick publications etc which is what your institution might demand from you unfortunately so i think it's important to deal with this like many of us dealt with this when we were school and college students you know uh, somewhere in school around 10th 11th standard we realized that how well you understand a subject and how good your marks are are completely independent of each other and getting good marks is a different skill set than understanding your subject but if you understand your subject really well and do not get very good marks then certain doors might start closing on you 
so many of us figured out the art of getting good marks while appreciating that it had nothing to do with understanding the subject and did both of them so that doors would not close and i think young people starting off a scientific career today have to take it in a slightly similar spirit uh, given that the culture of science has changed you need to get certain uh, publications out you know meet a certain marks threshold so that doors don't close on you but don't confuse that with the reality of doing science do that just to keep the system happy and do the science the real good science the fundamental questions to keep yourself happy and figure out how to balance it great great thank you so much for your views um, uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat box uh, krishna i have like three four questions i start and then i don't know how many questions you have got so you can start then so yeah i take this first question from ananita bhadra uh, she says that unfortunately the quality of research is often just based on how expensive it is um that's a statement yeah so i think we covered so, uh, to paraphrase iraq it's a statement not a question yeah. okay <laughs> uh uh next uh it's from abhishek he says uh, how pandemic will affect funding basic sciences like in college in evolution a lot of focus now is on developing vaccines and drugs etc so uh is it going to affect that you know like um, basic sciences uh, research in terms of funding like no i quantum of funding but that is not going to determine how much progress science can be in the subject yeah. made in this country there is a very very loose correlation especially in our area between how much india spends on the ecology and evolution and how many conceptual breakthroughs come out of india in ecology and evolution there is extremely loose connection so i don't think we should think we should, i don't think we should calibrate our problems our prospects our chances of success simply by looking at how many crores have been uh, going to be uh, estimated to be i don't think that is in fact if at all you want to ask you want to ask given the pandemic can i go into field work can i go to the forest now it turns out that in some cases actually you are much safer in the forest than in the city so in fact in some cases it might actually help been doing field work i know many people have said i have left the city and i have gone off to you know the countryside where things are much better so the, all these factors should come in it's not a rupee to rupee kind of thing we should worry about that and uh, uh, coming to anindita's question about uh, uh, quality of your work being judged by uh, how expensive it is it's true that's what i'm saying you must accept all of the reality and then you must fight for it you must okay so you must once a student of mine came to me very angry holding a rejected paper manuscript in his hand and he said why is it that if from united states the same kind of work gets accepted but for us they expect us to be much better i said they want you to be much better wonderful be much better if that you should be very happy that they want you to be much better why not be much better so you must make set your as i said earlier set your bar high and say my research is going to be so much better that in spite of its having the bad label of inexpensive people will sit up and take notice so yes there is pressure on us but we have to meet this pressure by simply raising the bar on ourselves about the quantity and i said if you do this twin things of raising your bar on quantity and lowering your bar on, on expense the combination i think you will still be able to swim in india yeah this one one interesting question from first year bachelor's student she says that um i'm doing my bachelor's in physics and maths and uh i can ask good question i'm creative also but how should i navigate you know in the academia like because i have just joined the university what are your like suggestions how should i navigate first year undergrad yes first year undergrad read read widely read what you don't like don't only read what you like i find many students say oh, i don't like that 
especially read why you don't like and ask yourself why don't i like one possibility is that you will begin to like it another possibility is that you will discover actually what is wrong with it and say what is wrong with it so don't shun what you don't like at this stage in your life read widely especially what you don't like that is what best this is the time where you build up this thing read widely talk to people listen to people don't go only by what you don't say i like this likes and dislikes should play almost no role in your foraging for knowledge and information at this stage in your life that other question is from the shashwat singh and he's he's talking about journal impact factors and he's saying that uh, does that could affect my you know scientific endeavor because i'm um i'm from like college in evolution side and do like made choice experiments and sometimes i find it you know difficult you know going you know this kind of work to those you know glossy paper journals you know that's what he want to mean so yeah what are your views like would you like to suggest him something like uh, regarding this impact factor on research you know like what you do by your interest and then where it ends up does that really affects yes it affects but the solution is that if your paper is so much better then it will that's that's why you have to have your face situation by setting your you know I, again uh, i i tell this almost half jokingly to my students i said let us send our paper to such a journal whose impact factor of the journal will increase because of our journal why are we always wanting the journal to make us great so we want to publish in nature because nature has a very huge impact on us so i will become great why don't we make journals great you publish your extremely important work in a journal that is not famous and make that famous we must take these challenges it's very easy to say oh i have a small handicap compared to my neighbor sure why you worry about small handicap but we must take this challenge let us publish our paper in a not so famous journal let the journal become famous because of our paper that is the confidence we should have and that is the confidence with which we should yeah krishna yeah i'm done yeah uh, i don't have any questions sir it seems they liked you more so written you sent all these questions to you <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, i do have uh, a question uh, to both professor joshi and professor gadakar professor joshi just pointed out that sometimes not it's not sometimes in fact it has happened to me also many times the results are not we expect and that's something which is very important the problem lies in understanding the result so to in uh, if you see something which you are not expecting and you suddenly look at it the first thought that comes to your mind is something is wrong with your experiment <laughs> not <laughs> not that the results are wrong, uh, is giving you something else of course you go back and check yeah. it you double check it and then you see that okay then we start looking at what is happening how do we get this i am a very young researcher i just have two students who have I've just started my lab I'm just one year old so i would really like to learn from you how do i convince my student that what she has got is really meaningful not just giving out all, all the details because if i tell her everything she won't have she won't develop the aptitude of learning him, him her or him they won't learn the aptitude of learning so i have to give a free end but then give them a free hand but also make sure that they are getting the crux of the matter how do we do that can you please give us some pointers for this because yeah that's a difficult one to answer because of something that I, professor gadakar already mentioned that see uh, there is no one answer fits all uh, kind of thing and in particular i am especially wary of giving advice because uh, you see the, the advice that i give for a given situation is largely also based on my personality my priorities etc 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 and and so the advice might be great for me it might not be great for somebody else who has a different personality or different set of priorities uh and and even to students seeking advice i often say look i can help you by by giving you pros and cons by giving you information but you are the one who has to decide what you want to do 
and you are the one who has to live with the consequences of that decision so take it care for the rationality uh one thing that i have found to very generally uh they they tend to uh, think of science as primarily being about the facts this is a generic problem because of the way they are taught science in school and college uh but in reality science is not actually all about the facts i mean the facts are there they exist i see the facts you see the facts even a fruit fly sees the same facts uh that the science is actually about the conceptualizations that we make in our heads in order to make some sense out of the patterns that the facts present themselves to us in so science is really about the conceptualization then i i do keep telling this to students that you have to develop over the course of your phd the ability to map your thinking between two spaces there is the fact space or the reality space and the conceptual space and you have to become very comfortable with mapping back and forth between them if you are really going to enjoy doing science you can't remain just in the fact space or just in the concept space and really get that amount of uh, enjoyment so for example i keep telling my students see we are using fruit flies we are working with fruit flies but our research has nothing actually in some abstract sense has nothing to do with the fruit flies the fruit flies are a tool just the way your laptop is and just because you are using a laptop to do your research doesn't mean that you are studying your laptop uh you know uh but many students never go beyond the flies in their thinking to them the research is about what the flies did what happened to the flies when i did something to them. but really what is important is in the concept space where you are mapping from these observations there and that's where the interesting stuff really is and i think once students begin to see that then they get a lot more into it thank you this professor professor gadakar please yeah i mean i just want to add one thing to what amitav said it is true that there are no general advice answers that you can give which are applicable yeah. but i'll tell you one thing that has helped me and both me and in my training students a lot see one of the problems i find is that we are when it comes to science we all our attention is on the end product the process of doing science is not is neglected we don't talk about the process when we give talks when we write paper nowhere it comes only the product so the student says there is a product i must somehow jump into space and go catch a catch hold of that product we must learn to pay more attention to the process of science now how do we do this one of the things that i do which is i find very useful and i try to make my students do pay a lot of attention to history of science read biographies of scientists read autobiographies of scientists read history of disciplines and that will change your way of thinking completely so the process then see the only way to learn the process is to look at history and we don't we don't teach history of science we don't uh, study history of science it's not a discipline so we must pay attention to the history of science and read the biographies and autobiographies of scientists and from that try to understand what is the process why science is done it's not a fruit hanging in space where somehow you have to jump uh, away from the gravity of earth and go and catch hold of it it's that how do you walk the path is more important the journey is more important than the destination and that journey is what we must bear thank you very much thank you very much so much you yeah definitely this will help you know, like all of us you know young students faculty members and all those you know i don't know we had like many um, many participants from outside all across the country so i think all will get benefited and we will put it on that our <coughs> university web page so like people who so want to listen it later you can get benefited with it so uh, rajesh i think we are hitting like there's one one more minute left so if you could you know uh, come and so that uh, we all can finish it in one and a half hours so rajesh yeah sure yeah so it's been uh, almost 1 hour 30 minutes and 
I'm, I'm sure we all are nicely glued to the webinar. So, uh, very encouraging and stimulating discussion on doing good science with whatever available support we have, especially for uh, early career researchers like us. So, yeah, and uh, again, uh, very interesting things like uh, PhD work done in less than $900 or at times being interdisciplinary in our own head or feeling jealous about someone else's uh, scientific idea or enjoying the journey of science rather than worrying much about the destination. I think these were really very interesting things um, and very interesting discussion. So yeah, I take this opportunity to thank both our guests today, Professor Raghavendra Gadakkar and Professor Amitabh Joshi. Yeah, so on behalf of School of Arts and Sciences, or especially uh, the lecture and seminar series team members, uh, I would like to thank you both for taking the time out and being with us on this e-platform today. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>